Days after former IB director Rajendra Kumar in an exclusive interview to Times Now revealed that there was pressure from a Congress politician in the Ishwat Jahan case, former Home Secretary now G.K. Pillay in an exclusive interview to Prema Shri Devi says someone at the political level did not want Ishwat L.E.T. truth to come out. Here is that exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview. Former Home Secretary G.K. Pillai is joining us. Thank you, sir, for talking to Times Now. Sir, please tell us, there's so much of controversy surrounding this Ishra Jahan case. Um, the CBI has come out with their investigation where they say that the Gujarat Police and uh, the Intelligence Bureau officers had colluded and they had cooked up this whole story and it was a case of fake encounter. Now, we did an exclusive interview of former IB Special Director Rajendra Kumar where he said that the CBI, in fact, there were certain greedy officers within the CBI uh, for post-retirement benefits. These greedy officers had manipulated this whole case. What is the real story behind the Ishtar Jaha case? See, I'm not going into the allegations uh, matters one in one sense uh, the matter is before the court uh, CBI has to charge sheet and prove its case in the court but all I can say is that uh, it was a very successful intelligence operation uh, and therefore to that ex to that part of it in in the sense that it ma we managed to uh, entice uh, the, the LET to uh, send their shooters into India and were able to monitor their activities in India and to, in one sense, if you want to say, uh, catch them. I think uh, it was a very successful operation from the intelligence standpoint. Now, you're making a very pertinent point here. You're saying that we managed to entice the LET operat operatives uh, into the country. So it was the intelligence bureau which enticed these people into the country? Yes, it was, uh, it was a very planned uh, operation and this is something which intelligence agencies all over the world do. So basically the IB had enticed these people into the country and they had uh, created a, probably they had laid a trap and then uh, targeted them. Yes, it was a trap uh, and it was a very successful operation because uh, you are then able to, you are basically using uh, the sources of LET or people who think they are uh, LET to be able to pass on the information and uh, being able to get people who would so it is always better to know your enemy as he is coming in rather than wait for collateral in intelligence when somebody plans something without your knowledge. And to that extent, I think uh, it was a very successful operation. Which means that probably the IB had cultivated a source where this source had probably enticed these LET operatives into the country saying that, look, you can probably target these people, these high profile people, these five people in, uh, in the country and then laid a trap. That's, that, that's yeah, what... That is basically uh, the sum and gist of what uh, the IB operation was all about. That is what happened? That's what happened. Now, uh, please tell us about the allegations being leveled by Rajendra Kumar against the CBI officers because they say, he says that the CBI, though the CBI says that the Gujarat police and the IB had colluded, the CBI has still not been able to prove or say anything about these terrorists or their backgrounds, whether these were LAT operatives or not. That's not there in the CBI chart sheet. Don't you think that the CBI should have, while they were doing an investigation, they could have, they should have at least spoken about or addressed this particular fact, whether these people were terrorists or not? See, let me just uh, in, give a background. The CBI is actually, in one sense, a court-directed investigation. So the CBI is perfectly within its uh, jurisdiction to carry out this investigation. But where I find fault with uh, the officers of the CBI was the fact that there was almost during that in that period almost a daily uh, what shall I say off the record briefing uh, of what somebody is saying, what some statements are being made, etc. And I think uh, when an operation or an investigation of this sort includes the Intelligence Bureau, I think the officers in the CBI should have exercised extreme discretion. You mean to say they were leaks? They were leaks, definitely. You see, if you see the newspapers at that time, it was leaks every day saying that, you know, so and so has said this, so and so has made this allegation, so and so has made that allegation and so on. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they should have kept quiet. And I think if I was the Home Secretary, I would have definitely have called the Director CBI and told him that, look, this is totally not acceptable. Now, the question is, did the CBI really have to investigate this whole case? Why was the case even handed over to the CBI? What do you have to say regarding that? 
No, there was a, there were allegations that uh, it was a fake encounter, mm. and uh, the matter had gone to the court, and the court had directed the CBI to do the investigation. So, on the investigation per se, I have no uh, question at all. Mm. The CBI is to do the investigation, mm. but they have to carry it out in a professional manner and ensure that uh, confidentiality is maintained mm. and not, uh, you know, as I say, uh, give daily uh, off the record briefings on what is happening. But since the IB is involved here, when you were the Home Secretary, at that point in time, if they were talking about handing over the case to CBI, would you really have recommended this, a CBI probe into this entire case? I personally would not have recommended a CBI probe, particularly because the Intelligence Bureau was involved. Uh, but uh, the allegation in one sense came up, it differentiated itself from the intelligence uh, operation. It was an issue of fake encounter and therefore that issue of fake encounter with a human rights violation is a, is a totally different issue on which uh, the courts had directed that the investigation take place and uh, I have no problems with that. The question as to whether these four people were LET operatives were not or not, uh, that has been the main question here. What do you think so? I mean, were these people LET operatives or not? Or do you think that, you know, Ishra Jahan needs to be given the benefit of doubt? If so, why? See, I don't think, I think you have to, in one sense, clearly dif differentiate. And I think it's important to understand that. Uh, whether or not they were LET operatives or not, that is one aspect. The second aspect is whether it was a fake encounter. Uh, I have no doubt in one sense that this intelligence operation involved the LET. Uh, so that part of it is separate. I think we have to very clearly differentiate between the fact that what the intelligence operation was concerned about and I think that should be in one sense separated from this issue of fake encounter. And I think that is very important uh, to make that distinction because otherwise you are, you know, mixing up the two and then trying to make allegations against... Uh, but was it a fake encounter or not? No, that is a matter which the CBI is now investigating and they have to now, they have, I think they filed the charge sheet against some and some others uh, charge sheets investigation is still going on to the best of my knowledge. And that is for the CBI to prove in the court of law. But was Ishra Jaha a terrorist? I would say that she knew that something was wrong because otherwise I don't, as I mentioned earlier, that an unmarried Muslim girl would not go with another married person to different places, etc., spend nights out and so on and so forth, which is not the normal pattern at all. So perhaps she knew something was happening. She could have been a cover. She could have been a cover. In fact, uh, it was one of the uh, claims that she was actually used because, uh, you know, a, a single person is like more likely to be sus suspicious but if somebody travels as husband and wife then uh, people are much more you know uh, uh, shall I say they don't look upon them with suspicion and therefore it's quite possible but since that part of the thing has not been investigated by the CBI uh, I will not like to make any any comments on that when the NIA report came to you on um, uh, David Headley's interrogation. Did it really speak about Ishra Jaha at all? Do you remember reading it? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think uh, there was any mention of uh, Ishra Jahan in the NIA report that I saw. But the NIA claims that Ishra Jaha, th there was a mention, there is a report apparently with the NIA which talks about Ishra Jaha as part of this entire, you know, interrogation. I have seen that, but I have seen now uh, David Headley's uh, questioning uh, in the court in the uh, Abu Jindal case and where he does mention that uh, she was an operative of the uh, LET. But w were you surprised when you when you really saw that because how how would David Headley really know about other operations of the LET? Yeah it is see the evidentiary value of that is limited because it's hearsay and therefore uh, it's nothing I can prove except that he heard somebody uh, mentioning it. But then a, a lot of what Headley uh, says is all hearsay except for what he did directly in Mumbai and when he was directly meeting the various ISI handlers and so on. All the others is only hearsay. Now the whole uh, uh, point here is that politics was played in this whole case.
the the basic allegations from the part of from the side of uh, the former special director intelligence bureau rajendra kumar is that a senior congress politician from ahmedabad was the one who hatched this entire conspiracy and he used the cbi to manipulate this whole case uh, do you really think that politics was played in the istra jahan case See, I'm, it's, it's very difficult for me to say because uh, whether politics was played, I think the whole politics of Gujarat from 2002 onwards in Gujarat, there's been a lot of politics in that. So I don't think uh, uh, it would be right for me to speculate, but it's, it's available on the, in the public domain on a number of issues. So I'm not going to say on that. But I think if one sticks to the fact that here was, there was one part of it which was an intelligence operation, which whether you want to say whether fully successful or partially successful. And if you separate clearly the fake encounter and the CBI investigation to that, I think you would get a much better perspective on the whole situation. But the way the CBI was acting at the behest of the government in this, in this particular case, I mean, did it surprise you? I mean, or is the CBI generally like this, going by what we've seen in the past? Yeah, by going by the past, I think the Supreme Court itself had said that CBI is a caged parrot and um, uh, that, shall I say, it depends on the uh, professional, uh, what shall I say, and integrity of the director CBI and the officers. Uh, there are any number of cases which have been there. If you read uh, even um, former DGBSF, uh, Ramon Rai's book, hmm. Khaki, hmm. when he uh, has a whole chapter on the CBI because he was, he had worked in the CBI hmm. and he gives how various cases were dealt with. And you can see the influence that uh, uh, political parties uh, or the government in power have had on the CBI. Uh, it is well, uh, well documented. When, when you were the Home Secretary, you've also come across instances where probably at some point you felt that you know, this is not the way a, an agency should be functioning. Have yeah, you come across were, there were instances? Cases, there were cases and uh, wherever I could, I took the necessary corrective action. And uh, I think you have to uh, differentiate. And this is what in the Indian system it's so important. There are officers and there are officers. And where the certain officers are, shall I say, of doubtful integrity or otherwise, uh, those have to be uh, weeded out. And there are very good CBI officers who have done excellent work. So, you know, it's not good to brush all of them, but there have been uh, black sheep in the CBI also. And also, you know, during the period when you were the Home Secretary, there were two affidavits that were filed, totally contradictory to each other. Tell us more about these affidavits and in what context were these affidavits filed? No, I don't think that affidavits were contradictory to each other. Yeah. What really happened was in one, there was a mention of the fact that uh, to the rest of my knowledge, now I'm uh, trying to recollect that uh, these people were uh, uh, LET uh, mm, operators. And operators and so on. And the other one, that aspect was deleted. Why was it deleted? I really wouldn't know because uh, that was not done uh, at my level. But it was done at a political level? Yeah, I would say yes, it was done at a, at a political level. But, but uh, what was the logic? Why would, why would they really want to? That is something which uh, you will have to ask the, the political level, not me. But uh, that's the... Now, when we spoke to Rajendra Kumar, he also spoke about how the morale of the IB offices, it was completely at an all-time low when this entire case had happened. Because here is a, time, a case which the IB thinks was an excellent operation. And they, in fact, uh, say that they wanted credit for it though they don't get their faceless you know, officers who never get credit for what they do. But then on the other hand, what happened is these officers were targeted. They were charge sheeted. Four officers were pushed to the wall and uh, the CBI investigators started asking them to reveal their sources. Now, these people basically are saying, the officers are basically saying that post this case, the morale of the entire IB came down and officers were really scared to uh, do undercover operations out of fear that when uh, they, they would have probably they would be in a situation where they would have to reveal their sources. Do you really think so that cases like this will bring down the morale of the IB and it's very important to protect the IB in certain uh, cases such as this? 
Yeah, I, I think, see, Intelligence Bureau uh, works in one sense uh, for national security. And a lot of things are done which, uh, you know, you may say that uh, they're not strictly within the ambit of the law. But that is the way it is done all over the world. And I think uh, provided that there is a close supervision and what shall I say, the basic guidelines are preserved, I think you have to let them uh, get that freedom to do it. Which is why, you know, even yesterday or day first day, I remember the Supreme Court, somebody wanted to file a PIL saying that uh, mm. uh, we want uh, investigation into the activities of IB and RAW. And uh, the Supreme Court, I think, right, rightly has said that national security should not, uh, cannot be, effect, should not be affected by investigating or auditing. Uh, uh, you can have parliamentary oversight of, uh, uh, but parliamentary oversight is always you will do on the on the broad issues, but you will not do on individual uh, operations and so on. And that is something which uh, is possible, can be done, no harm. But uh, you have to have that. Uh, uh, statecraft requires a certain element of uh, what I would call as, you know, much broader canvas to understand. Uh, you know, otherwise you you realize that everybody is, it's very easy to criticize the state all the time, mm. but when the state goes away and then you see the, uh, shall I say, the hooliganism and the uh, violence which then lies in its wake, mm. uh, then uh, the importance of the state comes into play. Now, Rajendra Kumar also goes on to say that 2611 could have been averted if the IB would not have been dragged into this entire Ishra Jaha controversy. Do you think this is far-fetched or this could possibly be true? No, no, I think it's far-fetched. I think uh, 2611 uh, failures were across the board by everybody. There, was, there were signals, but uh, nobody put everything together. And uh, it was a wake-up call. I mean, uh, for for everybody. And I don't, don't think we have fully even learned all the lessons even now. Uh, Why do you say that? Well, things like you know, uh, incidents like Patankot, Patankot. Uh, take place, and mm. uh, so there are some things which we learn. I mean, it's not something no. You know, we've seen Paris. You've seen the attacks which took place, even though you knew that. Uh, that place in Brussels was a hotbed of uh, extremism, but uh, they've not been able to deal with that. So uh, I think uh, it's a constant learning process and you have to keep on uh, updating your skills, your, uh, uh, hmm. your knowledge and your what I would call as the SOPs to deal with situations. And if you, unless you do that, uh, you are always uh, vulnerable. Coming back to the Ishra Jaha case, do you think that there will ever be a closure and we will ever get to know what really happened on that particular day. See, on that the day of what they call as the day of the death, the, the CBI is investigating that. I'm sure that when they file the charge sheet, there will be uh, a proper trial and uh, both through cross-examination of the witnesses, etc. What really took place, I hope, will come out. That, that will come out. But I don't think uh, the details of I think they, neither the intelligence operations nor other things, I don't think they sh will come out and I don't think they should come out also. It should remain a secret. It should remain a secret because that is, uh, it is something which, it, which is not for the public eye. Thank you. Thank you for Thank talking you. to Times now, sir. Thank, Thank you. you.